be honest, when we had finished the Sermon on the Mount for our Sunday night lessons, I was sort of almost at a loss. And I'm thinking like, you know, we did the Ten Commandments, and then we did the Sermon on the Mount, and I'm just so used to you know, having like a sermon series for Sunday night, I was almost at a loss. I couldn't figure out like, okay, well then, uh, what lesson can I put together, you know, for Sunday night now? And then so... Obviously, for the past couple of weeks, I'm very thankful for Hunter for uh, stepping up last Sunday night. He gave uh, an excellent uh, part two lesson on keeping our heads straight uh, by listening to simple sound statements. I love that. I mean, you made it stick. You made it stick. It's been going on in my head, you know, all throughout the week. Simple sound statements. Very, very simple. Very simple, very easy, and very sticky, I'd say. And so, as I was kind of like taking some time to figure out, okay, well, what can we discuss on Sunday night? Now, we don't have to do like a sermon series, but I don't really, I like to, because it kind of keeps us a little bit engaged, it keeps things a little bit more organized, and then so, finally, as I was studying, I'm like, well, I mean, since we're, you know, in the gospel accounts, I figured that, why not just, from time to time, do some lessons on the parables, parables of Jesus, and this morning's is going to be taken from Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, specifically, verses 31 and 32. Now, Matthew 13, when you just start right at verse 1, Jesus already jumps like right into a parable. And so the whole chapter is just filled with so much parables. And the parables, again, what Jesus is trying to focus on, it's um, an earthly message with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus is uh, making comparisons to what the kingdom is like. And so in Matthew 13, we see that Jesus found so many different ways to describe what the kingdom is like. He frequently employed the imagery of agriculture since uh, those who first heard his parables would have uh, readily identified with such comparisons. Uh, they're very familiar with these comparisons and these imageries that Jesus is using in his parables. And so when Jesus compared the parable to the grain of a mustard seed in verse 31 and 32, he used the smallest known seed in Palestine to convey his message. Not only was the mustard seed the smallest, it was incredibly the most prolific, the most profound, the most prominent one. Because, as they say, big things come in small packages, right? This tiniest of seeds often produced a tree between 10 and 15 feet high, big enough for even birds to lay nests on the branches. This idea was especially fitting to describe the kingdom because the prophecy of Daniel chapter 4, verse 9 through 12, foretold that all nations would eventually be gathered into the kingdom of God. And so the central idea of the parable of the mustard seed is... The growth of the kingdom. Hence is why tonight's lesson is titled, The Growth of the Kingdom. And within this idea, we find three dominant themes. Let's go ahead and read Matthew 13, 31, and 32 before we get into our major points. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Just within these two verses of this beautifully simple parable, three dominant themes stick out. Dominant theme number one, or Roman numeral uno, as I always like to say, is proportion. The first theme that we find in this parable is proportion. What do I mean by proportion? Well, referring to its size. In, the, in its proportion, this mustard seed is the smallest. That's the point A, smallest. It's smallness. It is the smallest of all seeds, Jesus says in verse 32. 
It is a human tendency to despise smallness. We are impressed by the biggest, the longest, the tallest, but you know, never the smallest. You, know, you will never cross a bridge proudly labeled the shortest bridge in the world. <laughs> Even Fortune magazine publishes a list annually of the nation's 500 largest companies. No one publishes about its 500 smallest companies, do they? But yet great things often come from small beginnings. The tallest building in the world began with the laying of one brick on top of another. Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is based on a simple theme of only four notes, yet it is a magnificent work of art, is it not? Jesus proclaims that the kingdom is like that, but even greater, even greater than the tallest building, even greater than the Longest, biggest bridge in the world. Even greater than Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Much, much greater. Think about the beginning of Jesus' life. It was insignificant by the world's standards, am I right? So hopefully you're able to see this comparison, this analogy that Jesus is making in regards to the kingdom. It started off, when you look at a mustard uh, tree, 10, 15 feet high, maybe even just a little bit more, give or take, but its beginning is very insignificant. Look at that. Look how tiny that little thing is. So now I want you to think back at the beginning of Jesus' life. His life was insignificant by the world's standards, that is. He was born of humble parents in an impoverished setting in a small backwater swamp town known as Nazareth. Numerous times they've asked, what good can come out of Nazareth? It was like a muddy backwater swamp. Later, he had only a handful of genuine followers, most of them devoid of power and wealth that usually launch great movements. He was even ignored by the rulers of the time, was he not? But before Pentecost was over, Jesus had approximately 3,000 followers, a number which rapidly increased and is now running right around in the millions today. A prominent historian, I like what he had to say, he once wrote that Jesus is easily the dominant figure in history. A historian without any theological bias, whatever, should find that he cannot portray the progress of humanity honestly without giving a foremost place to a penniless teacher from Nazareth. One of the truly exciting truths about God's kingdom is that you can never judge the end by the beginning. Paul promised that our toil is not in vain when we labor for the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. We may not see the end results of our feeble efforts to do great things for God, but that does not mean that great things will not come from those efforts. For example, some of the real unsung heroes in God's kingdom are those who labor week after week teaching little children the Bible. Yeah, it can be very frustrating at times, especially when you have a handful of kids with you all at once. Sometimes even the teacher may get discouraged and often wonder, are their efforts even worth it? But yet, no teacher can ever know when she or he might be teaching a child who will eventually become a great teacher of others. Who knows when they are teaching a future missionary, or a future evangelist, or a future minister, or a future elder, or a future deacon, or a future elder's wife, or a future preacher's wife, or a future deacon's wife, or a future women leader among the women of the church. The same principle applies to our lives as well. We may begin the Christian life feebly. We may feel deeply our spiritual weakness and inadequacy. But no matter what the beginning may be like, the possibilities are unlimited. The kingdom can grow in our lives with the same tremendous energy exhibited by the mustard seed. 
For Jesus will later on use that example of a mustard seed again in regards to our personal faith. He'll say in chapter 17, verse 20, If you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Jesus does have high expectations for those who are going to represent him and the gospel. He does not expect our faith to remain like a mustard seed. He doesn't want it just to stay as a mustard seed. He wants it to grow, to grow into a strong, beautiful 15-foot tree that's deeply rooted in him. He expects us to uh, to uh, uh, grow our faith, and when it does, we'll be able to do marvelous things for the kingdom and have the right attitude in doing it. Which brings us to our second theme of this parable, is power. The second theme we find here in the parable of a uh, mustard seed is its power. Its power for growth and change. That's subpoint A. It's power for growth and change. Notice that Jesus, when you look back at verse 32 of Matthew 13, he continues on by saying, But when it has grown, it is larger than all of the garden plants. The parable of the sower that he gave earlier, verses 1 through 9, and as well its explanation in verses 18 through 23 teaches that the soils into which God's word is sown in the spreading of the kingdom are our hearts. The condition of our hearts, whether it is uh, uh, rocky, whether if it is um, uh, thorny, whether, uh, whether it is um, on the, the roadside, or if it's good. Four different soils, rocky, thorny, roadside, or good, determines the eventual fruitfulness of his word within us. But the power for growth and change does not lie in the soil, but in the seed. In the seed. It is within the seed that the life potential dwells. Lotus seeds, I'm not sure if you are familiar with lotus seeds, but lotus seeds uh, recovered from Egyptian pyramids were able to germinate, even though that they were 5,000 years old. Can you believe that? They were able to germinate a 5,000-year-old seed. Would you even believe that if somebody were told you saying that this 5,000-year-old seed is able to germinate? I'd be like, uh-uh, no way. Let me see it. <laughs> well, sure enough, lotus seeds and Egyptian pyramids that are over 5,000 years old are able to actually germinate. Unbelievable, is it not? But believable. Likewise, whenever and wherever the seed of the word is received, it has power to produce growth and change. That is why such infinite growth as Jesus described with the imagery of the mustard seed is possible. The power lies not within us to change ourselves or to make the kingdom grow by our power. It is inherent in the word of the kingdom. Only by that, that is our power. That is our power source for its growth. While, study, while studying the principles of church growth are duly appreciated, we should be careful lest we get the idea that we can produce growth in God's kingdom simply by following the proper procedures. Because bear in mind with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Only God gives the increase. Though the church began... In adverse circumstances, sandwiched between the hostility of the Jews and the persecution of Rome, it spread dramatically beyond all proportion to its beginnings. Do not be discouraged about the state of the kingdom in your life. You may be experiencing opposition and perhaps even persecution, but if you offer to God an honest heart, spiritual growth will occur and no one can prevent that. The only thing is where it goes hand in hand with is depending on your heart's condition. What is your heart's condition? Oh, the power is in the seed. 
but are you willing to allow it to make that dramatic change in your life? If you want it to, got to have that good soil. Got to be receptive to it. The seed is where the power of growth comes from. We then bring our attention to the third and last dominant theme of this parable. Potential. Potential. Verse 32, he says, It is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. What potential does it offer? To be strong like a tree. To be strong like a tree. Isn't that what the psalmist said, David specifically, in Psalm chapter 1? When he talks about, I meditate on your word day in and day out. All throughout the night, I meditate on your law. And what does the law do? He says it makes me firmly planted like a tree by the streams. That's Psalm chapter 1. Folks, that hasn't changed at all. The seed, the word of God, has the power and the potential to make us become strong like trees. A seed always represents what can be, not what is. Where God is, great potential always exists. What a tremendous promise this means for you and I today who are in the kingdom right now. It means that regardless of everything, you and I can be better than we are spiritually. Most of us settle for too little spiritually. But remember, the great majority of men are bundles of beginnings. We all have great potential to be used of God, but we generally settle for the minimum of his working in us. If only we were as zealous to improve ourselves spiritually as we usually are to improve ourselves economically. <laughs> Why should we settle for being weak in faith? For a smidge of knowledge of God's powerful word. For occasional and haphazard service in his name. Most churches are often guilty for settling for too little. Someone has said that there is no greater burden than a great potential. And how true that is. When we have great potential, great things are expected of us, whether we are athletes, musicians, or Christians. But in the church, the potential is unlimited. Nothing will be impossible for you, Jesus says, Matthew 17, verse 20. Why is that? Because with God, all things are possible. How can we settle for so little by not striving for continual growth? Any congregation that is not continually stretching itself to reach more, serve more, give more, and send more, etc., is not cooperating with God to realize its own potential. God forbid that we should become content to be grass when we have tree potential. As we now, I guess, begin this new series of looking at the parables of Jesus. Most of these parables are going to be, like I said, comparisons with the kingdom is like. Well, the kingdom is like a grain of mustard seed. The church started off small. Oh yeah. But then it grew rapidly. And that's great, great application for us in our spiritual lives because the kingdom of God is not only just the church as the way Matthew uh, claims it to be, in Matthew 16, 18, but he also claims it to be the rule and reign of God in your hearts. The rule and reign of God in our hearts must continue to grow, must continue to grow and be strong as a tree that is firmly rooted in Christ Jesus. This parable then teaches us about proportion, power, and potential in the kingdom of God. We are reassured by Jesus to recognize the potential when the beginning is a small portion and challenged by the power and potential to become what we can be by God's grace. We cannot do this without God. Our hearts have got to be in it. 
our hearts have got to be filled with so much good soil so that his word can be so powerful and be so effective for us to be able to utilize the potential that we have. We have potential and it needs to be unlocked. It needs to be untapped. And the only way you can do that is by God and his word. Hopefully this will be a good opening to our new series regarding the parables of Jesus. But maybe there's someone here this evening who has not perhaps maybe filled up to their potential as they would like. Perhaps there's something that's keeping you from having that good soil. Maybe there's something that's keeping you from having that, uh, allowing God to unlock that potential. And it all comes down to sin. Maybe there's some sin in your life that's keeping you from let, letting God to, to enter into your heart and to allow his rule and reign to make a powerful impact in your life. The only way to do that is to surrender to him. Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ your Lord? Are you willing to finally let this sin, this burden, whatever it may be, to get out of the way and to allow his power to be unleashed within you so that you can live up to your potential in his kingdom? Like I said, the possibilities are unlimited, but it's only if you will allow him to do so. If there's one here that needs to get right with the Lord, that needs to repent and confess of sin, perhaps ask for forgiveness or ask for, for strength and for encouragement from the church to overcome a certain struggle or a burden that, uh, that you've been dealing with in your life, maybe there's one here that needs to obey the gospel. Whatever means... I encourage you, please come forward. We can help you in any way, together as we stand and as we sing. Kneel at the cross, Christ will meet you there. He intercedes for you.